on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hacker and Lyman, presented by River Wind Casino. For OU stuff, we talk some Jackson Arnold, Baker Mayfield, Adrian Peterson, even some recruiting. Then in the National College Football Roundup, the Big 12's got a new commissioner, and the ACC's got a new scheduling model, and we finish up giving you our winners and losers of the week. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right? Our man Michael Hostie will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Wednesday, June 29th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hacker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts, and the Beats and Bites Festival is rolling. Randy Rogers' band is on July 9th. There will be fireworks afterwards. It is $5 general admission and kids under 12 get in free. Going to be a ton of food trucks, all kinds of things for the kids to do, including face painting and an inflatable obstacle course. To buy tickets, visit riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now, recording this Wednesday morning, please leave us a five star review and a nice comment while you're at it. It's almost 4th of July, Ted. It's almost here. I know. Can't wait. Favorite holiday of the year. Yeah, so we, we wanted to get this out a little earlier because we know a lot of you will be traveling and we want you to, to, to listen to this while you're, while you're driving to the lake or going wherever you're going. Yep, it should be, be safe out there. Going to be a lot of people traveling, uh, but this is going to be a fun weekend. I'm, uh, I'm excited. The weather's going to be good around here. It's going to be fun. Nice. All right, let's jump right into the OU football stuff. And there's... There's a lot to cover and wanted to start here. OU quarterback commit Jackson Arnold is out at the elite 11 in California, which it's no longer just 11 quarterbacks. It's actually 20 of them. But when you look at the list of names there, the other quarterbacks include Malachi Nelson, which is obviously a, a name that a lot of OU fans are familiar with. Uh, Nico Iamaliava, remember the $8 million man? that's headed to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, Dante Moore is, is a five-star kid that still hasn't committed. Uh, Christopher Vizina is, he's headed to Clemson. He's out there. And maybe, you know, one of the headliners, Jaden Rashada, he's had a, um, let's say an interesting week with some of the news yeah. uh, about the, the NIL bidding war. Now, what is and is not true uh, with, with what happened with him and, and Florida. And now he's committed to Miami. So I, uh, the, the number out there is nine and a half million for Rashada. That attorney, by the way, God, that guy's got a big mouth. My goodness. Yeah, he's uh, he's on the verge of getting everyone in trouble, uh, being that out in the open about what's going on. Basically, the way he laid it out to me, and I guess he did say that he, he, he didn't take the most money, but sure sounds like an inducement to go somewhere, uh, the way he presented it. I love how the Florida collective, I think it's called the Gator collective, put a statement out. There's like, we've never talked to this guy. We've never talked to Rashada. We didn't do it. No, <laughs> absolutely not. It was, it was so funny. I loved it. The collective is issuing official press releases. Now it's great. College football. I mean, it's changed. Yeah. It's funny that, you know, he did say like, they're the worst collective he's dealt with and disorganized and all of that stuff. Uh, so now your collective has to have a public image, I guess, right? And you go into uh, repair mode. Fascinating. Yeah. So it's, but it is a fun event out there. And I know uh, several people that are out there that are covering it. So I, I've got, I've got boots on the ground in California watching Jackson Arnold and Jackson Arnold. He's currently the number five quarterback in the 24 seven sports composite. Uh, elite 11 clearly is a big deal how 
And I hate to put pressure on the kid, but with how OU recruiting is is going right now, with the fan base getting a little antsy, how how important is it that he goes out there and has a good showing? You know what I mean? I, I feel like that the fan base needs it to just kind of calm things a little bit right now in this time of tension. Yeah, well, I don't think there's any doubt that um, you've already got a rooting interest in a player that isn't even on campus yet and frankly won't be for quite a while but it would be awesome you know because originally whenever they offered him and he committed he was just a four star and they were pretty confident that he would eventually become a five star and he has but you know it would be awesome if he goes out there performs great and continues to climb and maybe ends up being a a higher rated quarterback uh, maybe then some people initially envisioned but like my biggest worry about the elite 11 is don't start talking to those guys about how much money they're making in their nil stuff right to where you feel like maybe you need to uh go snoop around and and see if there's some money on the table somewhere for you that's my whole worry about the the whole thing going on out there yeah that's a good point right and that's just that's just a reality now with these elite quarterback prospects, right? We're seeing these big time NIL numbers being floated out there. Yeah. I wonder, wonder what type of conversations Jackson Arnold is having with some of these other guys. And I, I don't know anything about the NIL stuff that Jackson Arnold's got lined up at Oklahoma. I I've got no idea. I don't know if he has any at all. So, but we're, we're seeing, I mean, just some massive figures and, you have to assume that plays for these big time QBs. You have to assume that plays a big role. I I will say, because we're recording this and only, only the first night has happened up to this point. And I've had multiple people tell me that Jackson Arnold arguably is the best quarterback there that he had. He had the best night one of any quarterback. There, There was no one that was more impressive. Than him now. These guys all have different skill sets, get di- different skill sets, different body types. But I had two different people tell me, man, just the arm strength, the accuracy, the touch, how comfortable he looks, moving out of the pocket, throwing on the run, squaring his shoulders, like being really accurate, running to his left. Uh, I'll tell you this: I I was fired up to hear it. I know he's just throwing in in shorts, but. I'd rather hear that than be like, mm, man, he's, he's really struggling. So uh, I, that it had me fired up a little bit. I know that. Well, yeah, if you, that's the, those are, you know, the best of the best and you go out there and not just look like you belong, look like you're perhaps the best one there. That's huge because I know like Jaden Rashada, a lot of people have said that he may be the, the best quarterback that they've seen in a long time. Um, you know, Malachi Nelson, obviously, guy that can move around, make plays. I mean, th- these are these are legit dudes um, that could, you know, had opportunities to go to most most places that they they wanted to in the country. So, yeah, I I love hearing that, and hopefully it continues. And that would be good buzz for Oklahoma, you know, coming out of that thing. That, you know, I know there's a lot of there's a lot of thought about you know, uh, these recruiting classes and how it ties into your quarterback. If, if the word out there is that Jackson Arnold was the best quarterback at elite 11, that goes a long way for him as far as, you know, becoming a recruiter for Oklahoma and bringing guys in to sign with him. Like we've seen quarterbacks do in the past. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a big deal. And it sounds like Jackson Arnold's off to, off to a hot start. And I'm sure there's, there's probably some really good receivers there too. Right. I would guess. Yeah. They bring in a bunch of those, you know, those top receivers to catch from because they remember they do a, they do a seven on seven tournament on the back end of it, which is actually, if you've ever watched, it's actually kind of fun to watch pretty competitive. I never thought I'd be watching high school seven on seven on the internet, but here I am. Isn't that how Spencer Rattler got like developed some relationships with some of the guys that came in with, with his class? Yeah, it, and it feels like these things are becoming more and more important because, because of the NIL stuff. And I'm not talking about the inducement piece of things. Hey, what are you getting where you're going? I'm talking about 
just creating buzz, right? The Elite 11 is a big deal. And if you go there and you have, you have a big time performance, uh, that, that leads to, you know, being talked about in more podcasts, being more articles being written about you. Like it's good for, it's good for your brand. And you also get to develop some relationships with some of those top receivers. And that's where you can convince your, you can try to convince a lot of those guys to come play with you and you develop those relationships with them. And relationships is really what this whole thing is all about, man. That's right. Yeah. Um, good sign. Keep it up. That would be, that would be great momentum for Oklahoma. If he's to come out of there as perhaps the, the best guy there in, in many people's eyes. Yeah. And it's good for Oklahoma fans because as we kind of predicted, uh, Texas commitments have been rolling in after Arch Manning committed to the Longhorns. I will say only one of them, you know, there are a couple of really, but they have like the one five-star safety kid. I think he's from yeah. out of Louisiana. Like, yeah, that's a great get, but the other ones, I don't know. It's like a bunch of three-star guys and not that, not that they won't turn into really good players, but I saw that and I was like, huh. That's not quite the caliber of player I expected to start rolling in for Texas once Arch got on board. But hey, maybe I, once again, not big into the recruiting scene. Maybe all those guys will turn out to be really good players. But I feel like the Texas recruiting momentum, it has, it has OU fans restless. And, and remember, Brent Vittable said that July, they are anticipating it to be a big month for them and it better be or else they're in trouble. But the, the staff's approach, it, it's a little different. We all knew it was going to take a little, little getting used to, but I don't think the fan base is used to it yet. Ted, they're getting a little uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's, that's normal, especially whenever you see um, your biggest rival having some success on the recruiting trail. Um, everyone wants, wants answers. They want, want stuff to happen right away. Not concerned about it at all. I think it's going to come. I think this recruiting class is going to be just fine. Uh, they're in on a bunch of really, really good players um, that they feel like not just in on them. Like they feel like they're, they're the leader and are probably going to get some of those commitments. Um, July is going to be big. I know there's a lot of players like to have it wrapped up, finished before they start into their, their final high school season sure that's going to be the case and i'm sure that we're we're probably going to be in some battles right up until signing day as well but uh fear not we're going to be just fine and i you know i feel like the texas thing is a bunch of guys that have offers like saying quickly oh man this is going to get a bunch of guys to come here i better commit right now or i may that, not have a spot that is how it feels right yeah when you see in National rankings aren't everything. The positional rankings are everything, but I was surprised. You know, it's like eight guys at this point and five of them. I'm like, Oh, I mean, okay. I mean, you know, good, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, it does feel like these guys are like, Oh no, Arch is coming. Everyone's going to want to come. I'm taking my spot. Yep. Yep. That's, that's what well, I had a little bit of feeling there, but yeah, man, I'm not worried about Oklahoma. I think they're going to be just fine. I know that they're, they're, like the most critical thing for me is like, I'm always interested in where they're ranked right at the end of the class. That's always a factor. And that's always what we're going to be looking at. That's just how, it, how it, how it works. But I know that they are finding the right guys that they want, that they've placed in a very high regard and they've been selective on who they offer. And I, I think, I think it's going to pay off. I think it's going to end up being a really good class full of really good players. Yeah. So uh, a few recruiting updates. Look at us. Look at us talking. Yeah. Recruiting. We're, we're doing yeah. our best. Sent some texts last night, trying to get some intel on these guys from, from multiple different sources, but got a commitment from Heath Ozeda. Three star Ozeda Ozeda. I'm going to Ozeda. Yeah. Ozeda. That's a sweet name. Big O, you got to call him Big O. Big O, yep. But three-star offensive tackle, 6'6", 295 pounds out of the state of Washington. Interesting, interestingly enough, born in Oklahoma, has got family here. I will say, and all I've been able to see is the highlight stuff. When I watch offensive linemen, 
the number one thing I'm looking at is how does he move? I, I personally, I want offensive linemen that move fluidly and look athletic on tape. And when it comes to high school guys, give me a guy that's a little skinny compared to a little too heavy, right? I am, I'm all about getting big athletes into the program and then adding strength and power from that point. Like if you can get a guy with this type of size that can move, I think Bill Biedenboe can develop the technique. And I think Jerry Schmidt can develop the strength and conditioning component of things. So as I watched him, I really like the way he moves. I do. I think he's a fluid athlete and that is a great place to start. I don't pay too much attention to, okay, what's his hand usage? What do his feet look like? No, no, no. How does he move with that size? And in these highlights, when he's working up to the second and sometimes third level, I'm sitting there, you know, jotting down notes going, okay, impressive. I like it. And I just like athletic offensive linemen and Heath Ozeda, he, he looks to be that type of guy and good finisher. I know it's a highlight tape, but lot, lots of clips of him finishing well down the field. And I, I like it. I know he's only a three-star. I know it happened quickly, but give me all the big guys that can move all of them. I want them all Ted. Yeah. You know, it is interesting. And, you know, just talking about they're being selective with their offers and they're really searching for the right guys, the right, right players that fit. It's interesting that bean bow goes all the way out to Washington state to offer a three-star kid. Right. I mean, there, there's something there that he has seen that he must really, really like. Um, and you're right. The, the athleticism part of it is the most crucial. Uh, pretty much every single position, you're going to have to relearn all of your technique stuff anyways, right? So uh, some of that stuff doesn't matter nearly as much. I mean, there is some carryover, but if you can move, they can turn you into a player. So that's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, another recruiting update. DeMarco Murray threw out the old Yamaha on Twitter. Everyone thinks it's going to be Dalen Smothers, which, by the way, Smothers, great. I mean, great football name. It is. But he is he's the number nine running back in the country out of the Charlotte area. So we'll see if that ends up being the case. But you can never have too many great, great running backs. And DeMarco Murray, you called it about a year ago that he was going to start doing some damage. And it's it's looking to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. His, it was kind of a weird start to his, his tenure at Oklahoma with the recruiting stuff because of COVID couldn't go and, and it'd be in, in, in players houses and walk around their, their high school campus and, and be the, the superstar, like the, the, the mega star DeMarco Murray NFL running back. Well, that's starting to happen. And, He's doing a heck of a job and they're starting to get in on some of these really good running backs out there and not shocking, not shocking to me at all. And I think the overall talent level at that position group is steadily rising and yeah. it, it's, it's, it's gone up, 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 and it's going to continue to go up uh, as we've got what Barnes and Sawchuck showing up this year. Eric Gray's there. Uh, Marcus major, obviously he had to transfer some from UCF. Like there's, there's starting to be some really good talent in there and to add top 10 running back in the country in the next recruiting class would be huge. Yeah. Okay. There's a couple top 100 players that, that have, you know, heavy interest in OU Caden green, a six, five, 315 pound offensive tackle is down to OU LSU, Nebraska and Missouri. And then I'm going to try my best to get this right. PJ Ottawa Nice. Audible War A? Audible War? Audible War is that sounded pretty that, good. Yeah, that's what I'm going with. And he's got OU in his top five. Uh, guy's a pass rusher, top 100 player in the 24 7 sports composite. Uh, said on Twitter he'll commit soon. Sounds like Caden Greed is, is going to be committing soon as well. But, you know, these top 100 guys, these are the type of guys that that OU needs to win these battles, right? 
and and I I know that you know BV and and this staff they're just getting started, right? But these kids are ranked in the top hundred for a reason. It's because they're physically gifted. That's ultimately yep. what it comes down to. And when you start with a kid that's maybe f- more physically gifted than other kids, if you if they've got the work ethic and they've got the right intangibles and attitude and all that stuff, that that's when you turn them into you know early round draft picks. So these are these are the type of battles we want to see Brent Venables and his staff win. It'd be it'd be really big if they win them in this first recruiting cycle i think they're going to win some of them i do uh they may not win all of them but i think we'll probably have the best defensive recruiting class that we've had in a long time and i don't even know like maybe rankings wise like the how high these players are rated maybe it's gonna uh, fall out that way it probably will because of i mean the inside backers that they've they're basically going to be down to making a choice bes- between some of these guys. And they're all like, they're all like the top 10 guys in the country. And yeah, the Omasigo, now he's only a three-star linebacker, but out of the state of Texas, and sounds like he, by the time some people listen to this, he may have already committed where he's going, but down to OU in Florida, right? Yeah. I think Samuel Omasigo, I hope I'm saying that right. I, my apologies if I'm not, but yeah, those type of players, like the the By Job kid, the kid from Community Christian there in Norman. He's a, I think he's like the 64th ranked player in the country on 24-7 sports, edge guy. OU's in his final three with Bama and Michigan State. You, you can't let guys in the Norman area out if they're top 100 players in the country, Ted. Those, those are the type of guys, got to keep them here. Got to keep them I, home. I agree. I think, oh, man, I think he's too, rated too high. Okay. Person. But I know nothing about him. I've just seen the highlights. That's all I know. He's, you know, he's physically super, super impressive. Um, super, super raw, you know, does, hasn't played hardly any football. Um, but he's got, he's got great length, great athleticism. Uh, he's, he's a basketball player. I dream was to be an NBA basketball player. And I'm always hesitant on that because football is a different animal than basketball it's for the and crazy people it's for like the us. crazy people and it's just it's just a different lifestyle playing college football than it is playing college basketball that's that's my worry but athletically great tools i mean sky's the limit as far as as what he could what he could possibly turn into that's the that's my my hesitation right there but like athletically checks the boxes there's there's our recruiting update how do we feel <laughs> about it we tried i mean we tried man feel good man um speaking of feeling good always good to have baker mayfield back in norman now little little ironic that while Deshaun Watson and that hearing is going on uh, where the NFLPA is trying to prevent him. And remember, it's the NFLPA's job to represent him, make sure he, he, he gets his due process with, with what's going on. But it does sound like right now Deshaun Watson's about to get suspended for an entire season. And meanwhile, Baker Mayfield's putting on his youth camp with kids here in Norman and doing a great job with it glowing reviews from everyone I talked to that sent their kids there and some interesting statements from number six there that they came out of, uh, came out of that. Yeah, no, you're right. It's here's the thing. And I kind of like it for Baker that he's uh, this whole thing was so messy in the beginning and it still is messy, but just like you, would imagine I, I, it looks like the the feeling across the country is finally starting to turn around in Baker's favor to say like the Cleveland Browns have royally screwed this entire thing up this whole thing by them is a massive mistake it's going to end up costing them untold amount of money um untold amount of wins 
they've got a great roster, but you're about to have a bunch of guys a year older, you know, that are in win now mode. Miles Garrett, Jadavion Clowney, those guys are getting up in age. And, you know, Amari Cooper, you're gonna add you're gonna tack on a season of them with uh probably gonna be Jacoby Brissett, right? At least a year. Uh, it may be more than a year with the way that things have seemed to trend here recently. So uh, I think things are looking up for Baker. I think there's, there's a good potential that he goes to uh, a place with a really good front office. That's, that's known for having a good front office, making good decisions and hell, he might even get a contract extension. He just might. So yeah, there's, I think there's a lot of people going, maybe, maybe Baker remained in the starter would have been so, fa- so bad. I, I mean, I know a lot of Browns fans. I was there two different times and yeah, they're not thrilled with how this whole thing ha- has played out. I, I will say, you know, Kerry Mar Kerry Murdoch and Eddie Radosovich, they, they got that great footage of him giving that answer about playing with the Browns getting that thing. I mean, that thing took off on Twitter. I thought they, Pat McAfee was talking about Murdoch on his show, which was hilarious. <laughs> if you haven't seen that, go check it out. But yeah, the quote, the quote from Baker was, I think it's pretty obvious. The mutual decision on both sides is to move on. And then followed up saying quote, in order for that to happen, there would have to be some reaching out, but we're ready to move on on both sides in reference to Murdoch asking him about playing for the Browns again. There's just no way like I, the, the situation's not salvageable. I, there's just no way, but you're right, man. It's, it's nice that a lot of people seem to be coming around like, Oh, it was cool for Deshaun. Now this, this thing just keeps getting even weirder. Kind of you've got now the the 20 of them were settled. I understand that, but yeah, I, oh, the Browns, what a, what a mess. Yeah, it's it's crazy uh, how this whole thing has unfolded. And like now the Houston Texans have been drug into it, right? Uh what looked like they had an NDA for him to give out and well, it sounds like the massage therapist for the team is like what he's doing is weird. Like something weird's going on and I I find it really hard to I find it really hard to believe that the Texans didn't have some knowledge of what was taking place. Like if you're, Hey, Deshaun, here's your NDA. Use this template we've made for you. Like that's yeah. Talk about a red flag, man. Goodness. No doubt that. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. And did you see the, the interview with the detective that worked the case? I oh yeah. Totally believes that a, a crime took place and yeah, I, it went to grand jury. The grand jury didn't, for whatever reason, like, I, I don't know that they ever make public, like what the information the grand jury saw, but I don't know, man. I, it almost feels like there's, there's building more and more pressure to go back to the criminal route as well, you know? And, and I don't know like when that is totally closed for good, but you know, I, I know it's all done in the, in the basically the court of public opinion, but I would say a very high percentage of people can recognize that something improper definitely was taking place. Yeah. I think, I think the majority of people would agree with that. Okay. Last. So you think I am not, I, I am not one to, to want to watch the celebrity boxing stuff that is that has not interested me like it has interested some other people but adrian peterson boxing Le'Veon bell yeah that's got my interest and yeah. reportedly gonna box each other in an exhibition on july 30th at crypto.com arena in la it's some event that's put on by a big youtuber so what do we think? I won't lie. I'm a little interested in this one. That could be a fun. That could be a fun watch. I'm definitely interested in this one. I have no idea what Adrian Peterson's boxing skills are. Probably very limited. 
but he's not boxing a boxer, which helps. Um, I feel very confident that Adrian Peterson is going to be a much better conditioned athlete going into this boxing match, which ultimately can play a massive factor. But I don't know. It, Adrian Peterson's the one really with everything on the line, isn't he? As he's he's looked at as like athletically and physically just like one of the greatest specimens of all time. I, if he goes in and knocks out Le'Veon Bell, everyone's like, well, yeah, of course he did. It's Adrian Peterson. But if he loses to Le'Veon Bell, then that is a story. Ted. You and I have had, we've had plenty of interactions with AD. I think he's, he's probably just from some of the things I understand over the years, he's probably just more concerned about the payout. (laughs) Probably so. Right. Not now. I'm sure. Let's put on a show, baby. That's it. Let's put on a show and and let's cash that check. So we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, I, I think a lot of OU fans are going to be interested with that. All right, birthday shout-outs time. This is this is a record low. We've got one. I'm going to give it to you. We only have one. Happy 56th birthday to Scott Brooking. Happy birthday, Scott. All right, let's talk about... Happy, how about a happy birthday shout-out for America? Oh, yeah, it's coming. Let freedom ring. USA, USA, USA. But... All right, there there's some big things that happened this week in, in the world of college football. We're going to talk about them. But first, the only place to stop when you're road tripping is Love's Travel Stops. Love's has over 600 locations in 41 states, offering 24-hour access to clean and safe places. Whatever your road trip needs are, Love's has it. Fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including, yes, my favorite, Java Amore. That coffee is fantastic. Love's also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones. They've expanded their mobile to go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there. Make sure you do- download the Love's Connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands. The Love's Connect app also includes a route planner and store locator. When you see that red neon heart on the highway, stop in and say hi at Love's Travel Stops. For a full list of what Love's has to offer, visit loves.com. Anopolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma Breakdown merchandise. If you want to live your life in buttery soft comfort, go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com and use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. You still get a discount on all the OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. Make sure you send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence. With a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio, no student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis's college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. And as a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, Contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Remember, financial aid is available. All right, time for the National College Football Roundup. Ross Dellinger, he's always got the scoop, but Big 12 made it official today. They have hired Brett Yormark to be the new Big 12 Conference Commissioner. And this guy, he was just the COO of Jay-Z's Rock Nation, and this guy's got a very interesting resume. Uh, No college athletics experience to speak of, but there's no doubt when you look at the resume, he's an impressive guy. Uh, Got his start. I listened to a couple podcasts where they interviewed him. Got his start selling tickets for the Nets way back in the day. Sold television packages for teams. Sold all kinds of things for the Detroit Pistons when they built their own arena. Uh, worked for NASCAR, where he landed them some massive sponsorship deals, uh, did that for six years, helped grow the NASCAR brand. He was the CEO of the Nets for 14 years. He helped facilitate their move from New Jersey to Brooklyn. 
was an integral part of the building of the Barclays Center and then managed that arena. I mean, tons of licensing experience. I mean, I, he may not have any college athletics experience, Ted, but you see quotes from people like Adam Silver and the CEO of Fox talking about how good this guy is at what he does. And I don't know, to me, it seems like a really good kind of out of the box hire for the big 12. They need some new creativity moving forward with that OU in Texas. And I feel like Brett Yormark seems like a pretty damn good guy for the job. Totally agree. Totally agree. I, you know, this is, it's an, it's an out of the box hire, but it's really not what's, the the hires previously, and I'm not just talking about the Big 12. I'm talking about typically, you know, your conference commissioner stuff until the, the Pac-12s was a little bit different. But, I mean, the most important aspect of what your conference commissioner can do is make you money, right? We'll deal with the we'll deal with the sports stuff. Like, the, he's got he's got people to help him deal with that. I mean, that part of it is not all that difficult. The The difficult part is positioning yourself in a, a very, very competitive market for dollar bills, whether it's networks, whether it's sponsorships, um, you know, whether it's, it's moving to a different, you know, media type of landscape. Uh, that is what is most important, dollar bills. And the Big 12 losing OU and Texas, the cash cows, they're going to have to figure out a way to get competitive and get back to making big bucks because I'll tell you what, man, it's, it's tough to go from high on the hog, getting that guaranteed check every single year coming in, and then your cash cows leave and all of a sudden your budget I don't know how much it's going to go down, but substantially. And like, how do you operate off all the things that you've built and you got to manage and you got upkeep and you got a staff. And now all of a sudden you're getting, I don't know, 10, 12, $15 million less a year. Uh, we got to find a way to make up some revenue. And I think just looking at his experience and what he's done looks like the perfect hire. Like, it looks like the most reasonable hire you could make. It doesn't look like a, 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 a shot in the dark to try and get something to work. It looks like the, the best way you could possibly position yourself moving forward with a guy that has all of the right connections to all of the big marketers, the big, big companies that advertise in sports. It looks like a home run to me. Yeah, and the most important thing, for him is going to be the big 12s new media rights deal, right? That's where, that's where you're bringing in just huge revenue for the members of the conference. And it was interesting. Someone told me uh, on Tuesday that Brett Yormark might be the best salesman in America. And that they're going to need it. Right. Cause like you said, you're losing OU in Texas. And while I think, the new Big 12 is going to be a ton of fun to watch. It's going to be extremely competitive with, with the four new members coming in. There are people that say, with OU and Texas moving out, that the conference loses around like 50% of its value Yeah, in, in the eyes of the television partners. It's up to your mark to change that perception of the league. And, and I'm really interested to see, see how much – money he can get the big 12 in that negotiation but it seems like they've hired a guy that's been a part of a lot of these negotiations right remember he was you know before he took over as coo he was he was doing a lot of rock nations like branding and licensing stuff across the world not just in america so this is a guy that supposedly has just an unbelievable rolodex and do people still use this it's just your phone, right? A Rolodex uh, isn't a thing anymore. 
No, it's, no, but we still say it. So he knows a lot of people. He knows the right. He's got people. a hell of a sell CRM. But I, I will say this. I'll be at Big Twelve Media Days covering that for SiriusXM, and and I know that I think he doesn't officially start until August first. I really hope Brett Yormark's going to be there at Big Twelve Media Days because not only do I want to talk to him about how his strategy when it comes to selling the Big Twelve. Once OU in Texas leave, I want to talk to him. Talk to him about that one year, maybe two years, of a fourteen team Big Twelve that's going to matter a whole lot to us, right? With OU still being in there, so I I want to pick his brain on what that looks like, how that's going to function, his thoughts on that situation, and of course, maybe I'll subtly work in a uh, an early exit possibility question. <laughs> for OU there it, just see how he reacts you know it's fascinating man I I think with these new rights deals coming up I think you are potentially about to see for the first time a change in a way people consume their sports if I was him uh, I would go to my Rolodex and see who I've got at Amazon or at any of the big streaming places because that's where it's going. I, w- traditional television as we know it is dead. It's just a matter of when when does the life support finally disconnect it, right? That's what's going to happen. and. You know, you if you can go to Amazon and and offer up your stuff to to someone like that, and you're a great salesman, you can make it make sense. Then I think I think that is I think that's the next leap. And there'll be a conference that does it first. I don't know who it's going to be. You know, ESPN Plus has their stuff and. And that's fine and dandy, but as we know, we've already seen Amazon start to dip the toe and the amount that they're paying for one game a week on NFL is like absurd. So in their eyes, carrying an entire segment of the country uh, right down the middle, the fan bases and the access that you have to, to those folks, then I mean, I'm sure a salesman could make that work if you get if you if you can tie all the details in and how to package it. Yeah, and not not only Amazon, but I don't know if you've seen a lot of this, but Apple, they're in yep. they're in Major League Baseball now. Yep. I mean, they're in the game and you look at how much money Apple could spend, right? They got so but you look at their market cap like they it's, need to it's like we have to find a way to spend money like what are we doing we, we've got to spend some of this revenue yeah and, and you look at what the new big 12 is going to look like three time zones um, maybe you brand as like hey the conference of competition maybe you play 10 conference games and that's a way to separate yourself you've got byu which i think people people underestimate the the reach of BYU it's not just in the United States like the you know Mormons across the world support BYU football and if they could watch it on a streaming service I'd be interested to see what those numbers would look like so I I think that you know there's a lot of doom and gloom right now surrounding the future of the Big 12 but the hire of Brett your markets it's got me excited for the league and I know some some OU fans may say who cares who cares about the Big 12 once once the Sooners are out? And the answer is, man, man, I do. And it's because even when OU's in the SEC, like you and I, Ted, will always be Big 12 guys. Like our Big 12 championship rings aren't all of a sudden going to say SEC champions on them. That's right. Like we we played in the Big 12 when when people are talking about you know some of the best players in the history of the Big 12. You know, your name is going to come up when, when they're talking about the great players in the history of the SEC. Your name's not going to come up because you didn't play in the SEC, man. That's right. So 
if some people say, ah, who cares? You know, maybe some people that say, I'll let the big 12 crash and burn. I'm not one of those people. I want to see that conference succeed. I, I want to see that conference flourish. Now it's not going to bring in the money, even not even close to what the big 10 and the sec are going to be bringing in. But I damn well hope that they bring in more money than the pac 12 and yep. more money than the ACC. Like that's what I want for the big 12. I want them to remain kind of in that third spot in the power five. There's a lot of people that are like, Oh, it may not even be power five. I talked to Heather Dennis on my radio show the other day. She said, it's just going to be a beefed up American athletic conference. And I was like, Oh my God, like that's not what I want. I want the big 12 to thrive once OU moves on. A beefed up American athletic. That is, it was stupid. That's not, it's, it's just not true. Um, you know, I, I, it is interesting to see like what the perception for recruits is going to be of the conference when OU and Texas leave. Like that's, that's the biggest thing. Um, but as far as the football, I mean, ask anyone that played Baylor last year, if it was just a, a beefed up uh, American athletic conference, like, their Baylor is a legit football team and they're going to continue to be Oklahoma state is super competitive. Now they have their ups and downs, but like on their cycle, whenever they get good experience, that's back. They're extremely competitive. The real difference is just the, the top, right? The sec has got some good teams at the top middle tier. The big 12 has been, pretty competitive with the majority of the teams in the sec, not the Alabamas, not the Georgias, not the LSUs, whenever they put their season together, but everyone else they're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're about on the same level as your, your mid to upper tier big 12 teams for the most part. But, you know, I think that perception with the recruits is going to be critical. And, you know, if they can, continue to put a conference champ into the the playoff that's going to be the biggest like saving grace for them yeah and i think if whoever someone kind of needs to establish themselves as the new king of the big 12 yeah because that's been that's been ou for so long and you know maybe it's luke fickle in cincinnati with with how they got things rolling hell ucf houston those places, those are both located in areas that have a ton of talent surrounding those schools. When you think about it from a recruiting perspective and, you know, can them being in a power five league, can that really make them, give them a boost when it comes to recruiting uh, BYU? They just got a bunch of grown ass men, man. So it's, yeah. it, it'll be interesting. I think it's going to be fun, but yeah, Brett, your mark, new big 12 commissioner. Okay. One other thing I want to talk about. The ACC has announced a new scheduling model that they will use from 2023 to 2026. So some quick math tells me four seasons. So, and if you are a big fan of ACC coastal chaos, you better enjoy this season because they are moving to a three, five, five format. Just a reminder, there are 14 teams in the ACC. So in the 3-5-5 format, each team will play three primary opponents and then they'll rotate the other 10 teams. So one year they'll play five teams. The next year they'll play the other five teams. Both of those years they'll, they'll play their three primary opponents. I do love the fact that it'll ensure that if you are a player that's at an ACC school for four years, that you'll get to play each team in the conference home and away. I think that's awesome. I... I'm upset that it's only eight conference games instead of nine, but I guess I understand that the three, five, five model is, is clean and easy. And this all has a lot to do with the rivalry games with sec schools that a lot of ACC schools have. I still wish it was nine, but what do you think of this? It, it, it makes a lot of sense going divisionless. I, I like it. I don't mind it. I don't mind it. Um, I, I think it's I think it's fine. I'm kind of with you. The eight conference games, especially right now, seems to be 
Um, I, I don't know. You feel like everyone's trying to move to more conference games to get more legit matchups for for network stuff instead of having, you know, your your four non-conference games, which is usually one good one and then a bunch of filler I, games. I guess the ACC doesn't really care because they're locked into that crappy TV deal until like 2036 or whatever yeah. it is. Maybe that's the case. Yeah. I like it. Uh, I don't mind it. Uh, anytime teams go divisionless, I worry about manipulation of schedules. I like the way that this one rotates. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Um, you know, I, I think it's in, interesting that right, just kind of how they, they match them up. Like, Clemson has Florida State, Georgia Tech, and NC State. All right. It's almost like NC State, we see you getting better. All right. We can't have you getting better. So you got to play Clemson every single year and get beat down. Okay. Got to make sure that they keep you in your place. You, you uh, are such a conspiracy theorist I when know. it comes to this. I know. I, I, I think it's good. I think it's ultimately it, it makes sense. You get to keep some good matchups in there. So. Florida State with uh, Clemson, uh, Clemson and Miami every single year. That's is, fun. That's good. Yep, that's good. Um, they need to get better quick. Yeah, and then Miami, what they've got, Boston College, uh, Florida State, and Louisville. So I I get it, right? The the eight conference games, I'm never going to like it. I just I think when you've got 14 teams in a conference, you should be playing nine conference games. I think the SEC rivalry games, like, yeah, was it probably hard to convince Clemson to add another conference game when they got to play South Carolina? And was it probably hard to convince Florida state when they got to play Florida and Georgia tech, when they got to play Georgia and Louisville, when they have to play Kentucky, hell, even Pitt, right? The backyard brawl is back. They got to play West Virginia. Was it probably difficult to get those schools on board for a, for a ninth conference game? Yeah, maybe, but they should have done it. I, it just looks I don't know if like anti-competition, I, I don't know. It just annoyed me that it's only eight, but maybe it's as simple as, Hey, you play three and then it's a nice clean division between the 10 and even five. I Maybe they just looked at it and let's, Hey, let's make this thing as simple as possible. Yeah. It maybe it does work out and it is, um, it, it's, it's fairly seamless. We'll see how it goes down. Um, I guess it always seems just, uh, I guess maybe it's that I'm so used to divisions that the first and second playing each other in the championship game, uh, it makes sense, but you know, I don't know. I'll just have to see how it plays out. You, it makes sense, but it's still, it's just still weird to me. You know, you, you know what? I just realized the Notre Dame component of it. Yeah, doesn't Clemson's got them on their yeah, schedule this year. Yeah, doesn't I think they play five ACC games a year? So maybe maybe that's one of the reasons. Like the schools are like, especially the ones that have the SEC rivalry games. They're like, wait, 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 wait. We're not playing nine conference games and Notre Dame some years. So maybe maybe that's it. Maybe the Notre Dame piece of it is kind of the part that I was overlooking, but. That being said, you should still play non-conference games. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, right now, like playing Notre Dame right now is a little bit different than whenever they kind of inked that deal, right? Uh, that when, Whenever I was getting recruited, Charlie <laughs> Weiss was about to get fired. And now Marcus Freeman, man, he got things rolling on the yeah. recruiting trail too. They look like they're about to uh, be a fixture. Yeah. All right, let's Good. finish up with our winners and losers of the week. But first, it's time to get back out on the golf course, people. And there's nothing better to drink on the course than the number one seltzer in golf, Clubby Seltzers. Clubby Seltzers is an Oklahoma company that's already winning national awards because their product is delicious. It tastes exactly like a club special, but it's a seltzer. They're not just for the golf course either. They're perfect to drink by the pool, after mowing the lawn, whatever. If you haven't tried Clubby Seltzers, go grab some. You won't regret it. The first variety pack is out. You want to find a place near you that has clubbies, visit clubbyseltzers.com. 
and attention business owners. You need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? Well, um, we touched on this a little bit earlier in the NFL offseason, but I got to go back to it. Terry McLaurin with the Washington Redskins. It's crazy the numbers that wide receivers are getting in the NFL. Third, he's played three years in the NFL, and he just signed a $71 million extension, $28 million signing bonus, the highest signing bonus ever given to a wide receiver in the history of the league. It's amazing to me. Now, he has played with nine different starting quarterbacks, okay? Um, that's a factor but last year he finished as the 20th receiver in in yards for the season he was 40th in touchdowns and he got the highest signing bonus ever in the history of the league that is just fascinating to me it it is interesting, right? Now, when when you compare it to some of the other contracts, the the total number, right? Not necessarily as eye popping, but do, do you think Ron Rivera was was just like, hey, pay the guy? He's had terrible quarterbacks. It's like t- Taylor Heineke's not getting it done for him, or I, I, I don't There's know. Got to be a factor. I mean, that has to play into it, without a doubt. But maybe he's just always open. Like I haven't exactly broken down the Terry McClure film. Maybe he's open a lot and just doesn't get the ball enough when he is open. Maybe he just dominates in practice. I, I don't know. But yeah, I saw that and I was like, man, scary Terry's good, but that's a that's a hefty signing bonus for him. Smart by him, you know, and and maybe he maybe he you never know how this negotiation went down. Maybe he he said, I'll, I'll agree to the the smaller overall number um, with, what, $71 million of, of new money on it. I'll agree to the smaller number, but we're going to get that signing bonus up as high as possible. So, I don't know. I just I, – I was like, do your thing, man. Hey, you've been, you've been catching balls for the last three years on a non-competitive team. Somehow that's netted you a $28 million signing bonus. Uh, that's a win, buddy. You did it. That's congratulations. It, it's all just to distract commanders fans from what's going on with Dan Snyder. Probably. <laughs> They're so. like, Hey, just, just we need pay some good news. Just pay Terry. Just do it. Just, just pay him. And they'll, they'll get people to stop talking about the owner. No. Yeah. It's, It's interesting, you know, you, we'll see if Carson Wentz (laughs) gets, gets him over the hump as a player. I, um, well, I don't know. Doubt doubt it, but maybe (laughs) we'll see. You never know. You never know. All right. Who do you have as your loser of the week? Oh man. I had to go with, uh, Freddie Freeman's sports agency. Oh my gosh. This is crazy. So I'm sure everyone saw that it was Freddie Freeman's first return back to Atlanta after leaving and free agency and going with the Dodgers. And apparently it was really emotional for him. And I guess, 
you know, he talked to some guys around the team after the game or, or while he was in town. And it looks like he's got some buyer's remorse on going to the Dodgers. And at least this makes it sound like he felt like he was pressured into doing something that he didn't necessarily want to do. Right. I mean, is not that how you take it? I, it sounds like, and the, the reports already fired his agent. They yeah. were fired, uh, fired Excel. Who's the, the sports agency that was handling his negotiations with Atlanta. And from what I understood, it's like, they, they basically just messed the whole thing up and actually ended up getting him less money in LA because of some of the deferred money and the taxes out there. Like he could have stayed in Atlanta where he is beloved. It just won a world series and they, they basically messed it all up. They, from what I understand is they messed things up with Atlanta. So Atlanta thought he wasn't coming back. They signed somebody. So then there wasn't room for him. So then he ended up in LA. I, it sounds like an absolute disaster. I love, I believe the word he used to describe his relationship with his agent right now is fluid. <laughs> Which I don't even know what that means. I he, here's part of it. Well, he is. He's he. In my opinion, he's going to be just as much at fault. You can you cannot be a professional athlete and have the California tax situation sneak up on you out of nowhere, right? that conversation has to be had like first and foremost, that can't be a, a a shock to the system whenever you get your first paycheck, right. And see that California state tax and millionaire tax and all that crap that they've got out there. And, and yeah, I, I don't know. That was, that was wild. And how do you feel if you're a Dodgers teammate? It, Maybe they don't care. Maybe no, everyone understands, and it's not that big of a deal. See, but do you see what Kershaw said? No, he was like, I don't know. It was it was something like, hopefully we're not second fiddle or something like that. Well, that's kind of what it makes it look like. Oh, it right? definitely does. The guy couldn't even go to the podium for the pregame press conference because he was so emotional. Like he, I think he was sad and mad and everything. It was it's a bad deal, man. It it's like. Um... It's like if you got married and then whatever went back home and saw your ex-girlfriend and then like disowned the friend that introduced you to your new wife or something. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's how does, how does everyone in that whole situation, that relationship feel pretty wild. Yeah. Here it is right here. Uh, Freeman had signed with the Dodgers for six years and $162 million. I mean, I, I don't feel bad for you, Freddie Freeman. I, I don't. But he said, although the deal contains $57 million in deferred salary, that deal in the end could be worth less than the total value of the Braves offer given the heavy deferrals in California state taxes. Mm. Brutal. He's got to be so pissed off. He was he he was by far the most popular player there. Oh yeah, uh, ever. Well, maybe not ever. Chip One Jones, of, maybe go win a championship though. And I, uh, yeah, pretty. Usually, when you win a championship, that like that is your like, the decision is made for you. You're you're a you're a hero in that community forever and you you sign there you stay there and and you've kind of the decision is made for you pretty wild yeah uh, sometimes there are a lot of great agents out there that are great people but sometimes they can mess some stuff up man happens Brutal. Brutal. all right let's get to my winner and loser but first first fidelity bank is a full service financial institution based in oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs Checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all, whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone. Everything is stress-free with FFE. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. 
FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. And if you're a whiskey or bourbon drinker, stop what you're doing. Head to your favorite liquor store and buy some Balcones products. You got to grab some of Balcones Lineage Single Malt Whiskey. It was just voted one of the top 20 whiskeys in the world by Whiskey Advocate. And you'll be shocked by how affordable it is. Also, you got to snag some of Balcones Baby Blue Corn Whiskey. It's made from blue corn. That's the fancy corn. And that is why it has won more than 25 awards. Last but certainly not least, you got to buy some of Balcones Pot Still Bourbon. It's big flavors make it the bur- perfect bourbon to drink year-round. Remember in 2012, Balcones Single Malt won the best in glass competition, beating brands like Johnny Walker and McAllen, and became the first American distillery to win that competition. This stuff is the real deal, people. If you love great whiskey and bourbon at a great price, then Balcones products are the only way to go. The whiskey may be made in Texas, but the owners, yes, they are from Oklahoma. To find a liquor store that has it, visit balconesdistilling.com. All right. For my winner of the week, thought about going, did you see this $500 bet on BetMGM? I did. I I don't, this mystery person, I don't know who you are, but congratulations. Thought about going with the mystery person that placed a free $500 promotional parlay bet on BetMGM that the Rams would win the Super Bowl, the Warriors would win the NBA title, and the Avalanche would win the Stanley Cup. Well, that's exactly what happened. And with the parlay's odds at 53,800 plus 53,800, this mystery person won a cool $269,000 off a $500 bet. That's crazy. That uh, incredible. You know, the the Rams were I I don't know where the Avalanche were dominant all year, best team in the league. So, I mean, maybe maybe that wasn't that that far off. I mean, they it's still crazy that it all happened. That's wow, amazing. Well, there there's a reason the odds were plus 53,800. <laughs> right. No doubt. No Unbelievable. Doubt. But my winner of the week, Russell Westbrook Oh, yeah. I mean, that video he put out, uh, what was he singing? Beyonce? He did. Now, I'll say this. He did lots of great things for Oklahoma City. I love him. But I love that the Los Angeles Lakers are about to have to pay him $47.1 million (laughs) next year because he has opted in to that in his contract. Uh, Knew he was going to opt in. Glad he did. Get your money, Russ. We love you. We appreciate you. But that is a big number. And things didn't exactly go well with the Lakers, you know, with LeBron and Russ last season. Uh, now, I'm sure LeBron absolutely loves the fact that Russ will be making nearly $3 million more million than him next season, especially with the Lakers going 33 and 49 last year. Now, I will say, the Lakers, they hired Darvin Ham. We'll see if he can get Russ to play some more efficient basketball. I wouldn't hold my breath on that, but cheering for him. Hope he plays well. But it, it would help a lot if Anthony Davis and LeBron could stay healthy. But him putting that video out there after all the rumors of, hey, maybe Kyrie Irving's going to get traded to the Lakers and all this stuff. It was hilarious that Westbrook, yeah, of course he opts in and then he puts that video out there. I, I got a good chuckle out of that. It's crazy. So they've got to be paying what three guys a hundred and thirty plus million dollars a year. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, they they are all, in my opinion, past their prime, some more so than the others, but I've got the numbers for you. Here we go. Russell Westbrook, forty seven point one. LeBron James, 44.5, and Anthony Davis, 38. Oh, 38. That's a, that, wow. The bargain. No it's a bargain doubt. for Anthony Davis. I thought he was a, I thought he was a super max guy before he went there also, but um, that's crazy. So, yeah, you're around $130 million a year on those three guys. Doesn't leave a whole lot of room for the rest of your roster with 
as much as all of the other role players are now making in the NBA. And I think they're going to be terrible again next year. Like LeBron James is still great, but he can't, he can't carry a team like he used to, Like they need, they need a bunch of role players. Anthony Davis cannot stay healthy. Russell Westbrook is, you know, he's, he's, one of the most explosive athletic guys that we've ever seen in the NBA, but you know, he's father time is undefeated. And as that explosiveness fades, you have to develop your game elsewhere. And I don't know that he ever really has or attempted to. Not a big believer in Taylor Horton Tucker, or Austin Reeves, huh? Look at you doubting Austin Reeves. Now I I'm with you. I don't think they're going to be very good. Yep. I, I just don't. I'm going to need to need to see it before I believe it. Those pieces just didn't quite mesh. But yeah, as far as do they like it? Do any of them like one another? Is that <laughs> do we know about that? I've got no clue. <laughs> I've got no idea. But NBA free agency, right? It's it's just kind of boring right now. Now we did. You, you had the Russ opt in. You had the Kyrie. That whole just circus and he ends up opting in and drops some very deep quotes as a, dare to be different Kyrie right you're you're a trailblazer opting into your was it 37 <laughs> 38 million dollars good for you Ben but I mean the biggest free agent names are but Jalen Brunson and him probably going to to the Knicks and then I guess the other big story is what's going to happen with DeAndre Ayton I I usually love the drama of NBA free agency and the NBA does drama well, but this, this cycle of free agency is just kind of boring, man. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've had an unusual explosion of, of trades and free agent moves and stuff like that over the past, gosh, what six or eight years. And this really does seem like it's the, the calmest of of the off seasons that we've had recently okay before before we talk about my loser of the week you are being attacked by a fly can you you can see it landing on my head that's the I, problem our, our youtube viewers are gonna love this do do we need to do anything do you need a swatter because it keeps landing right in the middle of your forehead and i can tell you are starting you're getting to the point where like you're getting angry and when you get angry you're kind of scary Oh, did you get it? Uh, I don't know. This is I, this is probably the best podcasting we've ever done. Right I'm here. armed at this point. I'll get him if he buzzes around again. Okay, if you hear if you're a loud loud sudden noise, that's uh Ted trying to murder a fly. <laughs> All right, for my loser of the week, I thought about going with tennis fans because it is Wimbledon. I, I enjoy watching Wimbledon. It's on during the day. It's something to watch. It's kind of kind of in the background all the time while it's going on. I was locked into the Serena Williams match. And she lost. I mean, lost in a first round match to Harmony Tan. Now the tie break was super dramatic, super fun to watch, but I had that moment of realization. I know she's been off for what, basically a year when it yeah. comes to singles. And I was just like, man, Tan's the, I even Googled it. I looked it up. She's ranked 115th in the world. And uh, watching Serena, the best to ever do it, struggle and, you know, look so rusty. It was just, I don't know, it just made me kind of sad. It's weird watching her struggle that way at Wimbledon. Wimbledon. I, you, you just expect, every time you, she steps on the court, you kind of just expect dominance. And then you realize she's 40 years old. I know. Father time yep. yeah, speaking of father time. So that was, that was kind of a bummer for me. I'm not a big tennis guy, but I, I like watching Wimbledon and Serena has always been someone where it's kind of appointment TV for me. I was like, I want to watch her because she's the best ever. I agree. Uh, I've always loved watching her play and I watched a, a pretty good chunk of that match too. And I think Serena, it, it looked like she felt, the same way as you and I like a realization of of where she is like yeah. she looked uh she looked very frustrated that 
she was in that type of a slugfest with the number 115 ranked player in the world. So yep. I don't know what that means for her moving forward. I don't know if it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I need to, I need to get it together. I'm going to, I'm going to make one more push to try and go get uh, another slam. Or if she says, yeah, it looks like this is the end. I, I don't know what that means for, her, but she looked massively frustrated with herself the entire time that yeah, she couldn't and, do the things that she used to. Yeah. And even afterwards in her press, her, they asked her about potential retirement and she basically was like, I don't know. We'll see. So yeah. kind of, I think that kind of gives you, gives you a look into where she's at mentally right now. Yeah. And it's, it's tough to play at a high level if you're not all the way in mentally. And then the other bad thing about Wimbledon, now you still got, on the men's side, you got Djokovic, you got Nadal, but Matteo Berrettini. How about that name? He, I think he was the runner up last year, if I remember correctly, oh. and had to withdraw COVID. Uh. And we're all losers because, Ted, I don't know if you've seen this guy. I feel like I brought this up before. My goodness, he's a good looking dude. <laughs> I mean, he uh. is one handsome man. And I think he's like six five two, tall, dark, handsome, Italian. Whoo! Well, at least that frees up my Fourth uh, of July weekend. I don't have to uh, stare at the TV. Don't don't have to stare at Baratini, Baratini. and be like, "Good yeah. Lord, look at that guy!" That's a, <laughs> whenever I watch him play tennis, I'm like, you know what? That's a that's a really good looking dude. All right, for my <laughs> Lou. Oh, I also thought about going with Brooks Kepka. Yeah, that was. I, I always thought Kefka is one of those guys that no matter what would shoot you straight, dude, no, he must've gone to the Lincoln Riley school of lion because no one is believing what he said about the live thing. He was like, it, quote, we never even had the conversation until after the U S open. Come on, dude. First of all, how did you not have the conversation? I, I assume the live golf tour came to you right when they were getting things started and asked you about it, what you've never had a conversation about it. That's, that's impossible to believe. Well, like, come on, man. It sounds like it's the, um, it's the, the creative uh, way. Like Lincoln Riley said, he never talked to USC until Sunday. Right. But his agent was, negotiating and building the deal for months like your agent is representing you when your agent is negotiating with somebody on your behalf you're talking to them whether or not you're speaking directly you're talking to them right this is the way to to avoid saying that but we all know what what is happening yeah so i i'm sure he's getting paid a fortune I think he's he's going to thrive in the live model, but I really wish he would have just been like, guys, they offered me a ton of money. What was I supposed to do? <laughs> like, right. I, I, I thought that's what we were going to get from Kepka, but maybe he's getting some uh, getting some orders there from the live golf PR people. Okay, but my loser of the week, and this is this is a frustration of mine, and maybe maybe some people don't don't share this frustration, but my loser of the week is FIFA. Now, we don't talk a lot of soccer on here, but FIFA came out. They've announced uh, they announced they've sold 1.8 million tickets for the World Cup in, I don't know if I'm supposed to call it Qatar or Qatar. Years ago, I was told it's Qatar, but I feel like on ESPN, they keep saying Qatar. So I, I don't know what to do. I'm going to go with Qatar just because, I mean, it's spelled with a Q and an A. So what, what are we calling it? What's the country? I call it. Qatar. Okay. Let's think, go with that. I think maybe it's supposed to be Qatar, but I sound like I feel like I sound like a moron whenever I say Qatar. Yeah, so I, Qatar. I just don't C U T T E R. That's not how that's spelled. I would just rather have people, even though no one ever would uh correct you on that, unless maybe you were in the country and I don't plan on being there, I go ahead and pronounce it wrong because I feel like I sound like a moron. So yeah. So we we'll go with Qatar. But a FIFA spokesperson came out, said they're going to offer, I think, as many as 3 million match tickets 
during the tournament. Like these are big numbers. It's awesome. But the reason FIFA is my loser of the week is we should be watching soccer right now. Yeah, this is ridiculous. I should be, I should be watching my son crawl around my house, trying to make sure he doesn't hurt himself with the FIFA world cup on in the background. It's late June of the year of the world cup. This is when it's supposed to be happening. I can't be locked in in November during football season, FIFA. It's absurd that we're not watching soccer and they're saying, well, Qatar, the weather, well, then don't put it there. This is ridiculous. I, I, I'm watching baseball. I'm watching way more Wimbledon than I normally should. I should be watching world cup soccer, which is exhilarating. I should be watching it right now, but it doesn't start until November 21st. We've got college football, the NFL, the NBA is going on then. How am I supposed to work soccer into my fall schedule? Ted, this is ridiculous. It should be happening now. We're getting robbed. America is being robbed right now. Yeah. Well, I won't be working it into my my schedule. Oh, you'll watch uh, the USA games. We all will. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not if they're on Saturday, I won't. That's true. You know? um, yeah. This whole thing has been a disaster from the beginning. Right? It, and maybe I'm about to flood our podcast with a bunch of misinformation. But didn't a bunch of people get in serious trouble over bribes and stuff over it even going to Qatar in the beginning? That that's kind of FIFA's whole thing though. Big, right. big bribe culture there in the soccer leadership. Didn't Qatar use a bunch of essentially slave labor to build all of the new stadiums and everything there? There were quite a few reports of, uh, deaths. Yes. Right. I, I, I read a little bit about that. Not, so far, don't think you're throwing out any false information. So good and, for you. And we're moving it out of prime viewing portion of the year whenever, I mean, I, I don't know. We're obviously a small portion of the, of the world that's actually watching what's going on. I get that, but you know, it's prime viewing you're changing what it has always been in the time frame where it's always been because you put it in this desert. It's just been a total disaster, but I loved the uh, announcement recently of all of the cities in the U S that are going to be hosting. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty, pretty sweet. that Kansas city is going to be getting one yep. when the world cups and when North America's hosting, that's, we're going to have to go to one of those Dallas, Kansas city. We're going to have to find our way to one of those. Got it. Got to check that off the, uh, the old bucket list. Yeah, I'm, I agree. That's, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. On that note, episode two twenty seven in the books, we'll have a new podcast that will drop on the 4th of July. Yeah. We're going to be talking big 12 football. It's all football with bill Connolly. We're previewing big 12 in 2022 so make sure you uh you look out for that one just a reminder you can hear teddy from three to six on 94 7 the ref you can hear me on sirius xm big 12 radio channel 375 hope you all have a great rest of your week have a fantastic weekend everyone have a fantastic fourth of july weekend until next time we appreciate y'all for listening do we always do oklahoma take care of each other